blessed love and peace another deep dive we got maybe about an hour of decent light daylight natural daylight so uh see we probably a little bit over um all type of buttery teeth um and uh god willing uh we'll complete the decent uh rendering joint uh for this session today the topic is eurasians of singapore i'm having this lean to the right type of thing going on all right not trying to trip on it too tough though um so singapore um uh, and particularly eurasians of singapore um so uh just a, like a brief um description so in singapore it's a, singapore itself is actually an island in southeast asia off the coast of malaysia um amidst the confluence of um islands going all the way to polynesia um where the pacific ocean and the indian oceans meet large space lots of mountains in the region too in those islands um and further so singapore is right off the coast of malaysia uh as the as the islands begin to do day team um very small very small and it's an island what's this say what's this actually it's a city all itself the island is a city and it's a city state it's its own nation that's part of the story and narrative um so eurasians are kinfolk um of mixed heritage that live in singapore for centuries long time established uh a distinct community uh within singapore uh and institutions a museum um uh, programs throughout the year uh and further so uh that's who Eurasians are as a, as a, like a, a general summary uh and so this is some of a description of the 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 background the history the the culture uh and again we we pride ourselves in this test run we pride ourselves in the lack of preparation so this is just off rip uh what i know haven't even done any sneak research uh in the midst of the unfolding of this test run we're just doing it and um we do have some multimedia today though because uh we recognize in the first joint uh we did some uh, right reading some excerpts and so in subsequent joints uh that recorded after that uh not so much multimedia in the previous joint so today we bring him back the multimedia and we have multi upon multimedia we have both audio as well as written word um so oh fantastic uh so what we lack in preparation we make up for in dazzle razzle dazzle anyway um but a bit of 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 a single pole single pole single pole single pole single pole um very multicultural country itself um which um uh, is the environment that the Eurasian community uh and and well we'll get into like details of it but the the, the Singaporean Eurasian uh community exists within uh and when what type of like Eurasian is a huge category of people so we're talking predominantly of Chinese Indian uh and all particularly Sikhi as well uh and then from the Eurasian or the European side it's um uh, Dutch English and Portuguese predominantly so uh, lots of different migrations and and um and 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 uh, connections and relationships uh within that but con ar ar arriving together and bonding together as a distinct culture within uh Singapore with Singapore itself having a distinct culture in Southeast Asia uh amidst all those respective communities residing in Singapore as well so again Singapore is a city state uh, just established about well, 60 years ago um and uh one of the richest countries in the world it went from 0 to 100 very quickly um so there's that that's the summary now to begin our joint again we begin with a oh we got a stick beetle going on outside we have an audience today oh that's nice well an, a non aviary audience an insect audience all oh, just flew off 
Anyways, all right. Um, and that's atypical from a stick beetle. Usually, they, they don't flex like that too tough. Um, all right, end these two quick. Continuing on. Um, Singapore, geography. I said it already. It's in Southeast Asia, right off the coast, lightweight, of uh, Malaysia. Is there a bridge? I don't even know if there's a bridge, per se. I think I know there's ferries. Um, I'm trying to think of like the commute. Uh, but anyways, that's later on. That's modern. That's very modern. We're, we're going into like prehistoric now, primordial-like history. So it's a, an island right off the coast of uh, Southeast Asia, Malaysia specifically. Um, and like I said before, it, be, it begins the large sequence of islands. Um, Indonesia, um, Bali, um, uh, continuing all the way into um, Polynesia, the land of the Morai and the Wurundjeri and further. So that would be reverse sequence, Wurundjeri, Morai and further. Uh, so that's like the, the, the geographical location. And then we're putting it further into the historic context of migrations. We talked about before the paradigm of um, migration from the, the equator region. Uh, and particularly al Belan, Africa. Um, and it, this is one of the uh, significant uh, narratives of creation and, and migration and explanation of civilization. There are many different narratives, and so we're like India. We absorb it all and make sense of it the best we can. So um, uh, in, in this general uh, synopsis of, of migration, uh, there's a migration from India, um, and Asia continuing eastward, uh, there's a big bump in the middle called the Himalayas. So there's a migration northward around circumambulating towards uh, Siberia and Manchuria and China. And then there's uh, the way through the Indus Valley, uh, through India proper, and then continuing on to the eastern part of the continent uh, where there exists today Thailand and Cambodia and Vietnam and further. Uh, this is this is the, the the vicinity Malaysia and this is the vicinity of Singapore. So, kinfolk is it is generally understood. Uh, and again, there's a number of different explanations, but it's generally understood. People migrate uh, from um, from parts of Asia into the peninsula of Southeast Asia, um, and then continue on further. Uh, into the islands, uh, and again, Singapore being one of these, uh, and continuing to all those islands that I mentioned um, in sequence, Indonesia, uh, the land of the Wurundjeri, the Morai, all the way into the Pacific Islands, and there's described a, a, um, a continuing migration, like back and forth after reaching out into the islands, into the distance. So uh, that's some of the, like, the long time history of Singapore. And that being said, um, again, it's, it's comparatively remote, um, and um, uh, there's, there's modest amount of, uh, habitation, um, for a, a, a duration and, um, to give some, um, folktale context, uh, to this ambiguity, we're going to share one of our first multimedia gifts or presentations. Uh, this is called, this is actually, again, it's a very brief uh, folktale that t uh, describes the beginning of Singapore. Singapore itself, uh, meaning uh, Lion City, Sing, uh, coming from Desi. Um, so, here's the, here's the folktale. This, uh, this is provided by uh, a website called Asian Folktales. So, um, this, is, this is actually gleaned from uh, previous work that we do in terms of accumulating stories. From uh, from different traditions. So um, that being said, here is here is the brief uh, uh, folk tale about the beginnings of Singapore. It is said that long long ago, a prince in Palembang, called Sang Nila Utama, was bored. He decided to go hunting with his men. In the woods, they saw a deer. But as he tried to shoot it, it moved swiftly. The prince and his men followed, trying to catch it. The deer disappeared, but from the hill where it had led them, the prince had a beneficial view of the surrounding islands. Looking out into the distance, 
Sangnila Utama saw an island that he had not seen before. It had sands that shimmered white on the beach. What is that island? he asked his men. Tamasik, they answered. Let us go there, said the prince. As they sailed towards Tamasik, however, a storm arose. The wind blew hard and the waves rose higher and higher. The boat was battered and in danger of capsizing. To lighten the load and help keep it afloat, Sangnila Utama's men began throwing overboard the cargo they carried. But still the storm grew fiercer. They tried throwing everything that they could possibly manage without. They knew their lives were further important. However, the boat continued to sink. One of his trusted advisors said to Sangnila Utama, Throw your crown overboard. It is the heaviest thing left on board. Perhaps the advisor had remembered an old story that said that Sangnila Utama was one of the descendants of the sea king's daughter. When the prince threw his crown overboard, the storm abated and the seas were calmed once again. So they continued their journey. When Sangnila Utama and his men landed on the shores of Tamasik, he said he caught sight of another animal, one that he had never seen before. It was magnificent, with a black head, a white neck, and a red body. It, took, it looked deep into the prince's eyes, then it disappeared from view. Sangnila Utama liked what he saw of the island. It was time he had his own place to rule, and he thought the sighting of the singer was an auspicious sign. This is where I shall live, he said. We shall call this place Singapore, or Lion City. And that, they say, is how Singapore got its name. So, um, that's, that's part of the folklore. Um, um, as the, the historic narrative of Singapore. So, um, amidst, again, the comparative modesty of details concerning the ancient history of Singapore, uh, we're going to fast forward into uh, the, 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 the visitor stage, um, where um, at some point, a number of centuries ago, Singapore becomes a very advantageous uh, location, strategic location, for uh, shipping um, and uh, military as well. It's right, at, as I mentioned before, it's right at the junction between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. So uh, through, this, through the years before that, through the generation centuries before that, people traveling from India, even from Arabia, even from Africa, um, going all the way uh, uh, past India, past uh, Southeast Asia, particularly with interest of China initially, but also finding these other locations in the Pacific Islands as well. So Singapore becomes a strategic location uh, between uh, India and China, right in the middle between the two. Um, very, very advantageous. And so that's established for a long time, uh, just within the immediate region uh, between India and Asia. And then when Europe comes poking along and say, oh, uh, is it, I want to say, they're, they're specific names, and I could just like throw out ones that occur to me, but I don't know if it's necessarily the, the right sequence or actually appropriate, or the ones who actually do it, but I won't do it then. How about that? That's one, that's one, one more protocol when, when like doing exams or whatever in our educational methodology, rather than guessing, um, don't guess. Don't give a wrong answer uh, because a wrong answer gets a negative point. A blank just gets zero. So that's a methodology just for in diplomacy, rather than guessing and being wrong, um, don't say it. Now, sometimes we can say, if, if, if it's appropriate or whatever, just give a very explicit uh, disclaimer, uncertain about this, so da da Anyways, that's a side note. Continuing on, um, a number of different, the, those explorers that go from, again, like Portugal, um, uh, Ned the Netherlands, uh, and otherwise, uh, make it all the way beyond India and keep on going. And then, um, I mean, Marco Polo already established uh, the um, uh, the Silk Road. Oh, no, I, mean, I shouldn't say that. The Silk Road is already established. Marco Polo travels along the Silk Road. Chains in the brain. Um, and then, uh, so people already know there's already trade going on from China all the way to, uh, to Europe. Um, and so once people begin circumnavigating uh, Africa from Europe, eventually arriving in India, uh, that would be after Columbus and otherwise um, had landed in the other direction, um, then uh, it's, it's like, oh, okay, keep on going. And then, and then uh, here's, a, here's another way to get to, to China. And again, 
when we're having by this point big boats with big sails it becomes further economical even though it might be longer actually it may not actually be longer um the in terms of duration the length is definitely longer um uh, to, compared to um w walking on land compared to going by sea uh, to go on land it's somewhat further direct just to go around asia through all the mountains initially but there's all different types of dangers and costs and 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 like heavy loads to bear um, animals got to do the carrying and further so that compared to boats um, loading up a boat uh, putting up some sails and and heading all the way around there was no suez canal at that point so heading all the way around africa um, and, and then making stops along the way um, and then going on continue on to india uh, and to uh, china and in singapore again being a uh, an advantageous strategic location on that route um, and then all the different like in all the local uh, regional trade going on already for, for hundreds of years um, Singapore becomes further advantageous and it becomes again a, a further a, a interest of, of um, uh, a, st a, a strategic military uh, location as well for the amassing of, of um, um, Navy uh, Navy shipyards and additionally so uh, there's a lot of the the so-called superpowers, uh, and that uh, obviously not just Europe, but Japan, China as well, um, having an interest uh, in in uh, in the in the strategic locations and, and, and methodologies of administration for the passageways of these places. So, because uh, there's taxes and taxes and taxes in all of these um, transportation uh, facilitations. Uh, so. Uh, It becomes an increasingly coveted location uh, and gradually Europeans become increasingly prominent uh, China is prominent um, in, the, in the region as well as um, within within Singapore um, and Again, this is this is again without the notes, without the research. This is coming from a very Western kind of bias and in, 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 in perspective, even involuntarily. Just this because this is what I have available. Um, so, the basic like history, like the the, the specific history, is, is kind of uh, contextualized within the colonial history. Um, the, the different parts of Europe uh, making different claims uh, concerning Singapore. Like I said, specifically. Uh, the Dutch and the Portuguese, as I recall, most, um, if I as I, I recall, most readily, um, and then eventually the English, and uh, again China and Japan continually involved amidst the arrivals of the Europeans, and and additionally, uh, but there are already being different uh, contentions in other places between Europe and and, and Asia. Um, in that respect uh, during the course of that period so um, during this time again Singapore is increasingly established as a port city uh, and a strategic location for commerce um, and military as well as w once being a place of commerce and trade uh, then it becomes a place of banking and finance um, and it, be it cultivates a culture of these types of services people being educated and, and being known and renowned for these skills, for these services um, that don't require agriculture, don't require, require a lot of land, because uh, it's an island, it's a city. Um, and so uh, it has, it's a strategic location for harboring um, ship, shipping vessels. Uh, and then with those arrivals of the ship vessels, then there's commerce, trade, finance, uh, and otherwise. So um, there are all these um, uh, occupations um, that are established these locations that are established and a reputation for efficacy uh, accordingly so uh, that's part of the history and, and the legacy and the, and the continuing culture of Singapore today um, so uh, a number of different um, kinfolk arrive in Singapore settle down um, uh, merchants um, and, and other kinfolk from India from China uh, Malaysia, it's right there, and, and, if, if, if we're, uh, and honor the indigenous people uh, in, in this narrative, and, and uh, 
it is recognized that the, the kinfolk who are um, the most indigenous to Singapore are the Malay kinfolk. Um, and so amidst all, the, all these names I'm popping out there, uh, Malay and Malaysia, because uh, Singapore is right off the coast of Malaysia. So uh, that is the indigenousness of, of Singapore um, and a prominent foundation within the culture of Singapore as well. Uh, so uh, to provide due respect accordingly. Uh, so there's the indigeneity of Malay, uh, there's a rival of uh, kinfolk from India, there's a rival of kinfolk from China, uh, as well as from Japan uh, considerably, uh, as well as other places around Asia. There's a rival eventually of kinfolk from Europe, um, Portugal, uh, Deutschland, uh, not for Deutschland, Portugal, the Netherlands, or Holland, or uh, the Dutch, and also England, uh, Britain. Uh, and Britain becomes the most um, um, predominant in the latter um, two centuries or thereabouts with its activity in India and, and other places. Um, and so during that time, with all these people arriving on this island, all these, all these different cultures arriving, um, there are marriages. There are people um, who, are, who marry uh, each other. Um, again, all different types of Eurasian mixes. Uh, f of each of these categories, um, Chinese, Indian, Malay, Portugal, Dutch, British, and otherwise. Some of it long, long time established, four or five hundred years ago. Some of it newly established. There are waves um, with, with occurrences of, 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 um, of, of, of global happenings um, that affects migration. And so uh, there are periods throughout the history where there are increasing waves that come from different locations, and then again, further marriages, and that kind of gets further infused into a distinct culture and community within Singapore itself. Um, so that brings us up to about the this past century. Um, and uh, before I go into like the further detailed history about the past century, um, just I, uh, give a give a, a basic like kind of synopsis of like the culture of Singapore. Do I do this now? I'll hold off. I'll hold off on this. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll try to like lead this off or lead off with this because it's somewhat of the positive light and stuff. So we'll, we'll try to save that for the end. God willing. Continuing on this past century, um, so it becomes increasingly contentious uh, as one just l looks at like world history, uh, the world wars, um, the further the incre significant increase of migration um, and mobility of large populations of people. Uh, and uh, there's locally, there's in terms of like the regional politics, the regional geopolitics, um, there is a considerable, uh, Singapore becomes kind of like a, I won't say a pawn, but like a middle kind of, um, a middle kind of coveted uh, uh, land or coveted island between the competition between uh, Japan and China. And that significantly factors into uh, the ethnic politics um, within Singapore as well. There is a time um, when, uh, particularly about a, a century ago, when Japan um, uh, predominantly, back up a little bit, predominantly uh, the population is, is, is uh, Chinese. Um, and... Uh, so much of the norms, much of the culture um, is, is established and, and, and um, um, Chinese prominent. Uh, so that is established amidst all the migrations and everything else. Um, Malay is also prominent, but Chinese is, is, is rather prominent as an, as, a, as an administrative authority kind of uh, cultural experience. So um, again, uh, particularly about a century ago, a bit as amidst the buildup of the, the Second World War, um, Japan, um, uh, conquer, oh, I won't say conquer, but Japan invades uh, Singapore, and, and the words here are charged, so I'm not trying to trying to be too like biased or whatever. But um, uh, Japan military militarily seizes uh, Singapore, uh, and there's there's a lot of um, um, uh, hostility uh, concerning this, and additionally, and so. Uh, Japan occupies Singapore for um, a duration, probably a number of years, uh, and and 
there's harshness, um, harsh experiences, and additionally, the details of it, again, I would have to refresh my memory, um, but there are harsh, there's harsh treatment towards locals, um, and then there's um, harsh resentment towards the Japanese accordingly. Um, eventually, uh, again, as is the case in a number of places around the world, Britain comes. Uh, as I, again, the history here is a little bit iffy, so I have to like work on the sequence. But eventually, Britain becomes um, um, amidst its continuing colonial presence before that. Um, there's an eventuality of Britain interceding. Um, and, and during the course of uh, the Second World War, Japan leaves, uh, formally leaves uh, Singapore. Um, so whether Singapore becomes a protectorate of uh, the British crown, that I, I, I'm precluded from stating um, absolutely or stating um, uh, Affirmation, just like uh, there's still some a lack of certainty of concerning th that actuality, uh, but there is some type of arrange arrangement in that respect. Um, so, after the Second World War, uh, there's somewhat of a um, a, a um, an ambiguous period uh, concerning Singapore. Uh, it's it's very multicultural. Uh, there's large populations of people from Europe still at that time residing in Singapore. Um, and again, the Eurasian community as well, uh, the Chinese kinfolk, uh, Indian kinfolk, Sikhi kinfolk, and further. Uh, so, and it's a very distinct, because of that, it's a very distinct society from the, the surrounding areas. It's distinct from Indonesia, which is predominantly Muslim at that point. Uh, it's distinct from the, the mainland of Malaysia, which is also predominantly Muslim. Um, it's distinct even from Thailand and, and uh, Vietnam and Cambodia, which are predominantly Buddhist. Um, Singapore is a combination of these. There's, there is, there's a large population of Muslims. There's a large place, population of Buddhists. There's a large po population of Tao uh, practicing uh, Chinese kinfolk. There's a large population of Christian. There's a Jewish community. Um, there's a large population of Sikhi. There's a large population of Hindu. Uh, so it's a very uh, pluralistic um, demographic society, demographically society. That was a way beautiful correction of improper grammar. Um, demographically, it is a very pluralistic society. Um, please hold your applause till the end of the presentation. So that's the... Um, that's the culture and, and how it's very distinct from the surrounding area, particularly 70 years ago or thereabouts. And so um, when there is this um, flux of um, political sovereignty concerning Singapore, that it was not a, a, a Britain was letting go of its col colonial uh, ways. So it's not uh, it's not a, uh, continuing as a British colony. Uh, and then again, Japan was just removed, so it's 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 not continuing as a, a Japanese um, extension. Um, there's the emerging uh, concerns about the East-West uh, uh, um, situation in terms of communism and capitalism, uh, and so for it to be outright uh, claimed by China would be somewhat um, choppy waters in the geo geopolitical um, um, ocean. So. Um, there was an interest of, of, of how to, how to uh, and, but at the same time, yo, Singapore is doing things. And so it, there's a very strong interest of it being um, stable um, and secure because it has the know-how and, ha and it's providing services for all these other uh, giants of, of, of civilization or of convention, uh, contemporarily speaking. Uh, so uh, one of one attempt is made for Singapore to join with Malaysia uh, as, as like a, a, a distinct entity of Malaysia and and that is short-lived um, uh, with um, it is very difficult because the culture of Singapore is very different from Malaysia Malaysia is uh, like as I mentioned predominantly Muslim has a different culture different norms in terms of um, uh, 
just culture and customs and, 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 and lifestyle. So um, a lot of the things that are that are tolerated in Singapore are, are less of a, of a thing within within Islam. So uh, as, a, as an official thing. So anyways, that was just that's just one of the um, that's one of the distinctions. There's still strong congruence between Singapore and Malaysia as well. Um, but that was that was less feasible. That was observed as less feasible. So then the um, uh, the decision is made for Singapore to establish itself as its own nation. Uh, and again, it's just an island. Uh, it's a small island. Um, it's a city. It's not. It's not even like a a, a full island per se. It's a city. Um, it's a city state island. Uh, so I mean, maybe not necessarily like Vatican City, but maybe like a Rome. You think of like the size of like the, the extending area of metropolitan Roma. Uh, but that being an island, that's Singapore, perhaps. Well, one can look up the, uh, the specific uh, uh, measurements. However, anyways, that's the, that's the general picture. So, um, But that does not stop it from becoming its own nation, its own sovereignty. A full-fledged member of the United Nations, a nation amongst the nations. So uh, that, that is, uh, Singapore is established as an independent nation, um, uh, did, like I said, about 60 years ago. Uh, and the first president of, uh, of Singapore uh, is of, of Chinese heritage uh, and, and becomes a legendary hero of Singapore because he leads Singapore from that experience of flux, of, of like ambiguity, of, of being like in the tug, tug of war between all these different entities uh, into establishing itself uh, as an independent sovereignty, as, an ind as, a, as, a, as a distinct culture. Uh, with all the different groups that live within Singapore, focusing on a plan of quote unquote what they like to call development, um, not they being Singapore, but the world, the world uh, convention. Um, so, uh, and and he and he's able to motivate, he's able to motivate the uh, the populace, um, and and maintain order. Uh, Singapore is known for being very strict in terms of uh, law enforcement. Uh, I remember growing up in the 80s and 90s, there's the, uh, the story of a boy who was caught, I think it was either doing graffiti or something like that, and uh, got a thrashing, because um, that was the penalty. Uh, so it was like hard corporal punishment uh, for things in the United States that would, well, depending on who people are, would be kind of like whatever, continue going on. Uh, but like, I think no chewing gum, stuff like that. So, but meanwhile, the streets are safe, comparatively speaking. Uh, it's clean, so um, hey, yeah, each one you gotta find to different, well, not different strokes for different folks. To each his own. Um, that that is the, the most appropriate one. Different strokes for different folks. But anyways, I'm just gonna like you know, Heisman in that joint. All right. Um, so he, uh, the president, establishes. Uh, this this stability within the society uh, and, and, and encourages kinfolk to be productive to the point that, like I said before, Singapore begins as a non-entity in the world scene in terms of being an independent sovereignty. And then within just a few generations, uh, establishes one of the largest GDPs in the world. Um, like one of the top 10 investors um, internationally, even within the United States. Uh, so, I mean, like... It, <laughs> It's comparable to Switzerland. One could say Switzerland is comparable to, comparable to Singapore, because uh, that's how like balling uh, Singapore is at this point uh, within the recent generations. Uh, and again, the major industries, are, uh, at least in recent history, is finance um, and uh, I mean shipping and and and, and, and otherwise. Uh, but a lot, I mean, tech is also big uh, in Singapore. So those things that, that, that are, those vocations and occupations that are, that are, um, that are world influential without requiring a lot of land. Singapore, that's it. Uh, and uh, so Singapore has a very high um, standard of living. Uh, things are very expensive in Singapore. Uh, land, uh, retail, uh, retail, real, um, um, 
residence and the places to stay, very expensive, uh, very condensed, like living in Tokyo. And otherwise, I have yet to walk in Tokyo in this life on this earth in this temporal realm. However, um, from what I understand, it's similar in terms of like the compactness. Um, however, there's also very strong social uh, programs in terms of education, health, and otherwise. So uh, there is an underclass, uh, and there there are ethnic, um, essential like soft soft weight, lightweight, soft soft apartheid uh, within Singapore. Uh, again, um, Chinese is the predominant uh, ethnic community, particularly within the hierarchies of society. Um, and uh, many of the people speak um, either Mandarin or another dialect of Chinese. Uh, the official language, I think, is actually English. And so that's like the common language amongst kinfolk. Uh, and each of the other communities um, speak each one's own uh, language predominantly still. I mean, continuing on and retains a lot of its, each one's own particular culture. India and the different languages from India, Arabic. Um, Eur uh, Eurasian, European uh, languages, um, um, English is, is, is like the go-to joint. Um, so that's, that's a lot of the back, uh, a lot of like the, um, the general, um, the general just, and, and Singapore is doing its own thing. Um, like looking, re when reading the constitution of the Singapore, like, well, like what the requirements are of the president, I think it's actually like no cap, literally. The, a presidential candidate has to be a millionaire, <laughs> serious. Like a, a presidential candidate has to like have like be a, a baller, uh, and one of the reasons and the logic behind that is that um, they have to have uh, own a business or have money and, and do things for an, a certain period of years to show that they have the the um, the skill set, the acumen uh, to to be an administrator and and to to run a business like running uh, like running a government. Um, so. It's not just a popular politician who's very uh, favorable amongst people, but has no skills in, in like running this fine crafted machine um, of, of Singaporean government. So uh, like just plain, no non-apologetic kind of things like that. Like, yo, this is how it is. Um, there's a lot of, um, again, a lot of investment, a lot of relations with the, the government of, of China. Um, and there is a lot of, um, uh, private entities that are established through the public domain of uh, of uh, the Singaporean government. Uh, so the, the the lines are at least the the pre the pretenses of lines um, that might be found in in the places like in Europe or the United States where there's a hard, hard fast no you can't do this and that's that's improper uh, church and state or private public um, boxes or whatever, it's it seems less uh, applicable or, or done in a different way, and in in those boxes and, and lines in, in Europe, uh, let's stay away from the commentary, but uh, it's it's a different way of, of those nuances. I'll just put it that way. Um, uh, but there is a very strong uh, direct interaction and relationship between uh, the government and uh, private entities. Uh, businesses uh, and ventures and additionally Singapore provides consultation to other island countries uh, particularly within the Caribbean and additionally about cultivating economics how to answer infrastructure situations and, and challenges as an island community um, and so uh, it provides ongoing consultation um, with with kinfolk around the world uh, regarding these unique kind of skill sets and, and, and challenges and solutions uh, did, 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 did. When I when I begin my formal studies in pluralism and mixed heritage and, and interfaith and additionally, um, I am immediately drawn. One of the, I, one of the things I do again. This is over twenty years ago, and there's not a lot of information on the internet available on this. Uh, and so one of the amidst the material I am able to find, one of the first things I do is um, uh, look up like in just like general registries, like look up societies, nations that have the most pluralistic populations, meaning that uh, at least three um, prominent populations of, of people of different ethnicities. So rather than just having like a binary of, of like 80% and 20% or 80 and 10 and 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, like where, where actually one specific characteristic is what nations exist where there is an absence of any one specific ethnic community 
comprising the majority of the population. So where, wherever the nation is, any one ethnic group is not greater than 50% of the entire population. What nations are there on this world, on this world, in this world, on this earth, that, that have that qualification? Uh, not many, at least 20 years ago when I look at it. Um, and so the two that I find most prominent, um, there, are a lot, there are a lot that kind of like blur the, the lines of that question, like Brazil, um, pretty, pretty much like the Western Hemisphere. But around the world, other than the, other than the Western Hemisphere, um, the pretty much the only two countries, that, one, the two that come to mind that I recall are Singapore and Mauritius. Uh, so the two ends of the Indian Ocean, uh, Singapore being on the coast of East Southeast Asia and Mauritius being off in the cut of, of Southeast Africa. Um, and both similar mixes in terms of Indian, Chinese. Um, Mauritius uh, has some for the African, but um, Indian, Chinese, European, and otherwise. So interesting, uh, that phenomenon, but it's very logical because Mauritius is also on that route. Uh, amidst the Indian Ocean, uh, Arab as well. So, um, but it's a unique it's a unique phenomenon um, where um, there's an absence, at least f from what I recall 20 years ago, there's an absence of any one particular ethnic group having further than 50% of the population. Um, and that requires that the society itself has some type of skill set to interact with each other. Um, and that even, particularly in the pretenses of a, of, of a democracy, uh, with with notions of of po majority populations and whatever else as a as a pre premise for political influence, uh, there is the necessity of coalition building, uh, not just in terms of like oh here's our token oh, we'll give you some attention at this moment, but like yo let's 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 try to do something and um, so that's something that was interesting that is interesting that I find about Singapore uh, just from looking at the the mathematics just from looking at the numbers the demographics. Um, and uh, when I become further involved in the interfaith movement, uh, I find that there's the interreligious inter organization uh, in Singapore as well that includes um, re representatives of clergy and lay leaders uh, from the different religious communities uh, within Singapore. Uh, again, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, uh, Muslim, uh, Christian, um, and... Siki, um, Tao, um, uh, those being the predominant religious communities, and, and each one having a, 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 an established, formidable local community within Singapore as well. Uh, and uh, again, retention of language, retention of rituals and practices. So um, part, part of the experience from what I observe uh, uh, within Singapore is in the, um, it's not necessarily a melting pot uh, situation or a mixed salad situation. Um, it could be called rojak. Uh, that's one of the national dishes of Singapore, which is a mixed salad that people mix together as part of that symbol of working together. And so uh, in that rojak of religiosity in Singapore, um, uh, there is a vibrance. Each one retains a vibrance and authenticity within each one's own um, tradition as well. Uh, continuing to visit with, with the original lands uh, and otherwise. So um, it's other than just like a, a rote assimilationist kind of paradigm as it can be found in, in, res in many respects further west in, in, in Europe and particularly within the United States less of this onus and expectation and imposition of assimilating into kind of like a, um, an ambiguity type of situation. So um, that's one thing. Now, again, that might be the green, grass being greener, um, but that's what is observed. Uh, and that is what observed w in the conditions surrounding the Eurasian community. So um, the U Eurasian community within Singapore uh, has a distinct culture of its own with distinct practices um, it, it is actually, uh, it tends to be, or w what we observe is, um, and, 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 and witness, is that there is a very strong European influence within the Eurasian community. And it's one of the ways of being, um, of being distinct, um, or perhaps distinguishing itself, which is two different things, um, from the, the, 
either any one particular ethnic group within Singapore or just a, an ambiguous kind of experience of, of multiculturalism within uh, Singapore. So there's a, there's, a spe there's a specificity within the culture and tradition, customs and history of the Eurasians within Singapore, the Eurasian society. The two basic groups, main groups within um, uh, uh, two prominent Eurasian um, groups within Singapore. Um, one is called Eurasian Society of Singapore, and I think the other one is called Singaporean Eurasians. Um, what the actual distinction is between the two groups, uh, I'm, I'm less, less um, inclined to speak to that at this moment. I do. I'm, I am aware that there are those two different groups, and it's been that way for a while. The two having, uh, I know I'm uncertain what the confluence is in terms of interaction and membership uh, between the two different groups, um, uh, and and there do there does seem to be somewhat of a cultural distinction even amongst the two groups. So, um, some of the distinct cultural. Uh, practices within the Singaporean Eurasian community at large in general um, is observance of Christmas that t that tends to be a unifying fun um, comparatively accessible uh, cultural celebration um, uh, and and the celebration is a cons uh, considerably Portuguese style um, uh, celebration a lot of a lot of the um, a lot of the religiosity innate uh, within um, the Eurasian community in Singapore uh, seems to uh, draw considerably from the Catholic um, uh, culture and practice, uh, particularly from the Portuguese uh, element. So how each European um, culture or constituency within the aggregate influences the, um, the, uh, the specific practices within the culture, uh, we're still learning on this side, uh, but that's what we observe. There's a, there's a, 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 a actual a dance uh, within uh, Eurasian culture in Singapore, and I think it's called the Jingli. Uh, so it's like a line dance. It's like a square dance, um, and the and the the garb that is worn is very much uh, influenced from Portuguese uh, culture, um, and uh, one of the things that is observed is how. Um, Again, when as distinguishing itself from either a, a, a straight up Chinese culture or Chinese community or straight up Indian community or otherwise, um, is the distinct experience of being of European heritage, and so that's something. Again, it's an ethnic experience that has parlance or or has some kind of like um, has some parlaying capability in terms of economics and politics within a predominantly East Asian region and East Asian community. So uh, it's a matter of saying, oh, you know, you want to do business here, or you're trying to find out some information here, whatever. The Eurasian community has a certain, um, uh, has a certain um, chip or whatever in those type of very pragmatic, um, conventional, um, competitions or leverages or otherwise and um, and in some ways well I mean there's there's straight up European kinfolk who live in Singapore as well and so if people want just want to do business with Europeans people could just go to Europeans however um, there are nuances about again being mixed and, and this and the other um, many Eurasian kinfolk have multilinguist uh, uh, skills uh, and that is a significant factor in terms of uh, strengths of relationship with, with the respective communities involved. Um, and they're all different types of mixes. And again, class factors into the different uh, ethnicities as well. So um, I mentioned Malay being indigenous uh, to Singapore. Um, and in, in, in honesty, uh, Malay is, is essentially treated like a lower class. Um, the Han uh, Chinese is essentially like the hierarchy of, of society. Uh, Europeans are kind of like the honored guests. Um, and um, uh, then, I mean, maybe, I don't want to like just be very rude or whatever, but just giving people a general idea. Then uh, Indian, Asian, um, and 
than Malay uh, and, and, and that being like the general uh, like societal uh, uh, order or whatever, quote unquote, so to speak. Now, obviously, uh, and so that, that, that translates to jobs, that translates to education, that translates to income, that translates to the socioeconomic uh, the differentiation within society. And again, it's very high and it, it, it gets very low. The very low still has a lot of social programs made available. However, uh, there is a drastic uh, differentiation um, within the lifestyles and additionally, and that often plays out along the lines of ethnicity as is just the nature of life and civilization. Uh, so uh, the mixed heritage, Eurasians, uh, again, with Europeans being the honored guests, uh, Eurasians kind of parlay that middle position um, of, an, uh, of like establishing a distinct uh, niche within society ongoing for generations um, and um, taking on a lot of the... Um, political uh, I don't know. the political um, uh, tropes of the higher higher socioeconomic class so um, in the in the delicate uh, rhetoric when it refer when referring to kinfolk of, of the the lower uh, socioeconomic um, uh, stratosphere. Now that being said, um, well, so that that that's what what is observed. Uh, and again, there are institutions. There are Eurasian institutions. There's a museum, um, and there there are other cultural institutions and uh, establishment within conventional society um, offices and otherwise. So there's, there's a strong relationship between the Eurasian community and the conventional leadership within Singapore um, and uh, continuing to, to maintain its uh, distinction um, and, and, um, uh, and thrivingness. Uh, I'm observing myself as I'm doing this and I'm recognizing that uh, distinct from other joints, one of, the, one of the differences of this joint today is that I abstain from giving like a linear biography that's helpful to get, a, to get a sense of the, the life experience. Um, and again, that's attributable to my, to my knowledge at the moment. Um, and so I'm, I'm sharing some of the stuff that I do know. So it might be less uh, like engaging or otherwise, however. Um, we got dazzling still. We still have some razzle dazzle. Um, so. Uh, what else, what else, what else, what else? Oh, so it's also a beneficial to recognize that quote-unquote Eurasians is not the only type of mixed heritage experience within Singapore. Haha, ha, how about that? Because, um, to be honest, I'm uncertain what, what like the gatekeeping policy is for Eurasians um, specifically. Um, uh, generally speaking, it, it, it tends to, from, from what I observe, it tends to be, again, Dutch, British, and Portuguese on one side of the Euro side. And then predominantly Chinese, uh, and perhaps maybe uh, some Sikhi or otherwise. And I'm uncertain, like how those politics, officially or unofficially, directly or tacitly, factor in to who is considered Eurasian and who is not. Whether if somebody's of Indian ancestry, but then of um, African ancestry, how does that factor in? Oh, that's I don't know about the European side. I, I'm my knowledge is comparatively modest concerning that. So. Um, but there is there is a distinct culture. It is established within like in relationship with the hierarchy of society. So and because of that, it tends to be further um, guarding in terms of who is let in, uh, because even just people who say the wrong thing or see or, or rock the boat a little bit, that has adverse implications in terms of those relationships within the hierarchy. So um, I say that because one particular mix uh, or one category demographic that is very relevant and that is very like um like does call things to question is the malay kinfolk when kinfolk are mixed with malay and otherwise um how that factors into acceptance as a eurasian uh, uh specifically um because again um just as the cases within colonial history around the world the indigenous kinfolk are tend to be considered as uh, with, with less respect and otherwise, and, and it being very quiet and very significant. So 
um, for Eurasians to include mixed heritage Malay within the mix um, poses implications in terms of the, the Eurasian, as, Eurasian community as a whole being as readily accepted within the hierarchy of Singaporean civilization. So this is commentary rather than necessarily details and information, but I'm trying to um, portray some of the experience within the culture and otherwise, and kind of like um, making up for the names and numbers that are absent from this from this deposition. So, all right. Um, before we get into the razzle dazzle, um, I already mentioned Rojak. Uh, and that's one of I, I learned about Rojak many years ago. Uh, even even we even established our form of our own Cuyahoga, Ohio version of Rojak here. Um, that includes beans, black beans and rice, basmati rice particularly, um, yams and uh, corn uh, and some additional uh, ingredients. Uh, curry, curry, curry tofu as well so anyways that's another story um, I'm just having I'm just having, it's been a while since I had some of that road jog it's not that bad actually ha 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 I'll share this one thing one thing this is like off topic but it's still on topic uh, I share the, the road jog with kinfolk dear beautiful kinfolk who are actually Baha'i there's a Baha'i community in Singapore as well um, and uh, it, within it's, it's it's a beautiful family and uh, I am I'm being the host um, albeit in a place that's not my place so, um, like, in the preparations, I have a lot of quote-unquote excuses, but it just it wasn't, it wasn't properly shared. I w it wasn't properly hosted, I should say. It wasn't properly provided. So, made the best to do. Uh, but it was a Shabbat dinner, of all things. Um, and, and, and the challah didn't get fully baked and, and everything else like that. And I'm hurrying to, like, um, complete it. It's already past, past candle lighting time. And that's a whole other situation. But anyways, point is, like, at some point, uh, we had, like, a deconstructed road jack. Like, all the different ingredients for the road jack are provided in different bowls because, like, it's, it's, it, t it takes steps to get to, to acclimated to our style of, of road jack. So anyways, um, one of the sistren, the, the nieces, um, young, young sistren, um, very, very beautiful and polite, um, just very respectfully asks me about one of the ingredients um, and asks if it's a carrot because it's orange and it's crunchy and I say oh no that's a sweet potato it just hasn't been cooked all the way ha 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 anyways classic anyway all right, that's it um, but that was that was uh, that was inspired by Singaporean uh, multiculturalism and the road jock uh, culture so um, practice <laughs> Oh, such patience too from the kinfolk too. Beautiful patience, beautiful patience for it all. So, and we actually had a beautiful dinner, uh, conversation and song. So, all right, uh, lifting of spirits. Um, so, Baruch Hashem, Alhamdulillah, Hallelujah, Jayom, Shishe, Mado. Um, so, anything else to share on this thing about Singapore before we get to the razzle dazzle? Uh, The beat goes on. Uh, Singapore continues to evolve. Uh, the culture, uh, particularly with with uh, media being further available, uh, young people being able to learn from other cultures, and additionally, Singapore is already well established and well known for being a multicultural society. Um, it's a city, uh, so it's a very much of an urban uh, culture, uh, and for better and for worse. And uh, there's there's the shishi glamour lifestyle and then there's like the plain hawker get some food lifestyle uh, uh, if for those who want to have a car <laughs> cars I think cost like 10 times as much something like that or maybe cars cost twice as much as they would other places however that's only half of it actually it's less than half of it because uh, t to get a car is one thing but then to get a car license a driver's license to drive the car ha oh, the license costs 10 times as much as the car does. What a... So again, strong classism. Meanwhile, plenty of public transportation. Uh, cabs are available. I think those are expensive. Uh, so there's still ways of getting around. And again, it's a, there's a, it's a, a social 
type of uh, a lot of the social policy in terms of health, education, uh, safety, um, um, caring for vulnerable within society and otherwise. So, uh, dee 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 dee. Within that type of culture, there's easier. It's generally easier to have some type of um, uh, relationship with neighbors and and um, reconciliation with kinfolk who are different from oneself. So um, uh, that is some of the uh, general experience of Singapore as a multicultural society. Uh, and then uh, the Eurasians of Singapore uh, as a distinct group, as, as a distinct community for many generations, for hundreds of years uh, within Singapore. Uh, so with that being said, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up with the, with the razzle-dazzle. Oh, it's razzle-dazzle. Oh, it's how, let's build it up further. Oh, it's fantastic. It's awesome. It's beautiful. Wow. Okay. Anyway. All right. Um, so this is actually, it's actually a song. Uh, and I'm uncertain if this is going to get blocked um, for copyright proclamations. Um, so we're just going to share the story and uh, let's see how it goes. The video is actually unlisted intentionally initially god willing so don't know how much that factors into it either um, but anyway here's the story so about 20 years ago actually thereabouts um i find out about a, a music company a music um like label um, that that provides quote unquote world music now the term world music for many people is cringe because people get ideas of like just fake um, plastic aesthetics of culture that are essentially exploitational, either self-exploitational or appropriation or otherwise. Um, and so we, we, we get that. But at the same time, particularly 20 years ago, there's little else in terms of um, knowing where to go to find music, authentic music and otherwise. So uh, Putumayo Music has this collection of albums that, are, that tend to be... Um, Regional specific tend to be even just like specific on specific specific according to a nation or a region Africa Asia um, Different countries within each Europe Middle East um, native uh, areas native lands of this uh, hemisphere so um, South Asia East Asia and otherwise um, and hundreds at this point hundreds of albums and 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 from artists from each of these locations so there is a certain authenticity amidst all the uh, legitimate uh, s uh, scrutiny and otherwise. Um, so all that being said, um, I'm trying to th like I'm trying to think of what I can say positive, like like categorically positive about Putumayo, uh, or, or or whether I it, it, uh, I'm wanted to do so. Uh, Putumayo provides a lot of beneficial music. It provides a lot of beneficial introductions to legendary musicians from different cultures. So that's one of the benefits that Putumai does. And that's what I learned from considerably, again, over 20 years ago. Putumai also does get involved in some of the like, uh, appropriation kind of type stuff. And, and it has to sell stuff. And so that's that's what it's catering to. It's, it's a very, it caters primarily to a very Eurocentric Western audience that buys music. Uh, and so the, 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 selection, the song selections and definitely tend to be very cheery and, and this and the other so uh, for people who who like are cultural aficionados um and, and 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 listen to it or hear it or whatever they can they might be thinking oh that's just like um that's like the gaslight it's like cultural gaslighting uh, so there's sort of legitimacy within that and but again that being said particularly as a learning uh, tool and as a le learning learning process or whatever being introduced to musicians, being introduced to genres of music, and additionally, it's very beneficial. Putumayo has a lot of um, albums uh, in that respect. Um, and th the musicians do come from those specific locations. Some of the musicians are very well known. Some of the musicians are comparatively um, low-key or otherwise. Um, there's another group called Playing for Change, which has a different kind of niche in terms of working with street musicians. But anyways, that's that's who look listened to initially uh, over twenty years ago thereabouts. Uh, now, one of the things I will say about like it, it, that's challenging concerning Putumayo, and this is for many years. Don't I haven't don't know what it, what the status is at this moment. But one of the concerns is that 
Putumayo, uh, at least a number of years ago, uh, has very few selections coming specifically from East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, even uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, uh, and otherwise. Uh, and, and, that, and we recognize that's not by accident. Um, and that there's, I mean, Putumayo has like 20 different albums, probably actually like 50 or 100 albums just coming out of India. And it becomes so nuanced. And yes, there is that market demand. And additionally, um, but it gets into like very dif distinct, um, detailed like um, genres um, within different cultures, um, Celtic tides um, and uh, drums of the Middle East. That's a little bit of, I'm, I'm kind of um, exaggerating that particular album, but it gives that very specific. Meanwhile, like just one particular um, album about music from China or music from Japan, not available. Um, there are compilation albums from South Asia and, and from other locations as well. And then there are like compil there are compilation albums of like all of Asia. There's like an Asian groove that has predominantly South Asian. And then it might have like one track from like Indonesia. Uh, and that's about as like as readily available as selections from East Asia are in the in the general offerings of Putumayo. I bring this up with the kinfolk at Putumayo, and this is all relevant. This is actually going to the point, and this is this is leading into the razzle dazzle. So, uh, I actually I talked to the kinfolk at uh, many years ago um, uh, at Putumayo. They're like, "Yo, where's the East Asian culture? Where's the East Asian representation?" And and brethren was like, "Yo, we got some." I'm like, "Come on, brethren, let's be honest." I'm, I'm like, I was, I was actually in the middle of purchasing things at that moment, like a large list of CDs. So this is like, I've got a right to say something, whatever. Um, we, we have to get off that mindset too, of just because somebody buys something that, that gives them like, sanction to say anything, that ain't it. Uh, it's just a legitimate uh, thing and there's motivation for kinfolk to listen. So did I just like nullify that statement by double talk? La da. Anyways, um, so the bedroom at first wanted to say like, yeah, we got, we got, we got albums, we got, we got this, that, and the other, and there was one album that was specifically um, East Asian. That was a, uh, I think actually there, there might have been two. There might have been two albums, and that was it. One was a um, uh, a children's uh, playground kind of music, and then the other one was like a, a lullabies, children's lullabies. So those were the only two selections. Compared to like again, like I said, and this is not hating any other group or whatever, but just like the Middle East had like 20, 30, 40, 50 selections. India has 50 selections. Different parts of Africa have like 50 selections. Um, Europe, same similarly. Uh, different, all the different like 20 types of uh, salsa uh, and otherwise. Um, all the different types of drinks from Brazil specifically, the land of the Guarani, uh, and two albums. Uh, those are the only two albums, um, even even like the Asian groove, hardly having any tracks from East Asia. So, ha, here we go. We're getting there now. All that being said, on uh, I, I, and actually, the uh, the brethren were very beautiful and responsive, talking with me directly over the phone when people used to talk on the phone back in the day. Um, and uh, he get he sends me a um, a list. The off the off menu the off the, the list off menu whatever of like even further tracks like off that are off printing or whatever that were still available from the inventory of of um, things that they weren't offering on the website at that moment and so he sent me the list of like all these other um, albums and so from that uh, there is there is a couple additional ones that I find uh, one was one is um, music from the tea lands or something like that so again tea lands what's the, what does that mean um, and but on that album there are a number of tracks that are from East Asia um, and I think there was one other one so um, we continue on to to uh, facilitate the acquisition of, of those two additional CDs and on one of those CDs there is the track that I'm about to share God willing um, and oh, after all that I should remember the name of it shouldn't I I've been listening to it for nearly 20 years uh, it is called Kong Mandor. Uh, and so actually, to be honest, the details of it, additionally, um, um, I, am, I know less about. What I do know is that it's, it's, a, it's a melodic tune. Uh, it's like an easygoing, kind of like, just like gentle breezy kind of thing. Um, 
And so uh, it's, it is a regular fixture within many of my playlists for many years at this point. And as is the case with much of uh, the personal or the, the multiculturalism that I and I experience here, it becomes challenging because we know of few other people who know the same songs that we do. We listen to songs from around the world that are popular amongst many other people around the world. But in terms of here in Ohio, cats ain't listening to this stuff too tough. So when we hear something we enjoy and we want to talk with somebody about it and like, just like, you know, we talk about music, less available. And, 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 and if it might be, if I meet somebody who's a student or whatever, and I say, oh yeah, do you know about so-and-so? Oh yeah, fantastic. Then I'll say, well, what about so-and-so from this place? And they'll, nope. So anyways, that's just, that's just the scene right here. One of the challenges, oh dear, so, so, so sad. Um, but anyways, all that being said, all that being said, sad, 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 it, it has a it, it's, it's a beautiful thing uh, that's frustrating because there are a few people that I can talk with about this song. So anyways, and that, that, there are many songs like that, musicians and, and concerts and otherwise. So all that being said, what I'm going to do here, right here, right, right, right here is play a segment of that song, Razzle Dazzle, that might cost the posting of this joint all right so this is this is uh again kong mong door uh even even the the um the playing of it uh i'm without the details about the musicians and otherwise and i, I try to be fastidious about that but at the moment I, I, it's unavailable so i'm just gonna play the play the song um just a part of it just to get a sense of the the tune the song it goes on uh, but that's the gist of it and uh, so I listened to that for going on 20 years at this point um, and I probably I can probably count on my hand the number of people that I know in life directly personally who also know that song what uh now if you heard it if it plays if this video is still up are you impressed is it like okay whatever okay that's fine to each his own, different strokes, and all that stuff. Now, that's not the end of the story, though. Um, because just in the past year, there is another discovery. So first, I begin by saying, oh, I'm learning this joint. Are we going to be multimedia, proper multimedia? Oh, it's been a long time since I practiced, like weeks, months, maybe generally speaking <laughs> wheezies let's do some type of representation here practice we're just gonna leave it like that that's probably that's just gonna it's gonna clean it up the best right there so 
uh, I actually do learn some songs, one of which is Kong Mong Dur, at least the beginning melody on this joint. Uh, it's been a while since I've practiced, like I said. Yo, we got to practice and keep practicing. That goes for everything in life. Language, eating, <laughs> all things. We got to keep practice if we want to keep it up. Um, so anyways, this is one of the instruments that I'm learning. Uh, slowly, surely, Jill Scott. Um, so... Uh, I got a nice, easy lesson from Kinfolk here as well. Um, now, Dietze. Now, all that being said, point here is this. Um, about a year ago, uh, when I'm looking for uh, lessons or examples of, of Kinfolk playing Dietze online, I find nothing less than the Singaporean Dietze, Dietze Society. Uh, and it just so happens that at that moment, again, about a year ago, maybe been two years ago now, um, at, amidst the arrival of the Lunar New Year, uh, the Singapore Dita Society completes a project of recordings of members of the society playing the Dita um, and wishing people uh, a happy new year. So um, one of those recordings, many fantastic recordings, beautiful Kinfolk sharing beautiful music in those recordings. Such riches, tremendous riches. That's that's where we at today. And we're talking about world music. That's where we at. Traditional music of the world. Finding the local musicians who are representing and, and, and continuing on the culture. That's the riches. We we we, we like all right, anyways. So uh, the the Singapore Dietze Society provides a very uh, very generous gift in in uh, in sharing these recordings. And one of those recordings includes a quartet of young brethren. Um, and it appears that three of the brethren are Chinese, perhaps Han, and one of the brethren is Malay. Ha ha, how about that? We got multiculturalism going on. Um, and so there's a video. Each of all the recordings are video recordings. So it's a video recording of the, the actual music being played, which is very valuable to, let, to see the instrumentation, to see how it's played in, in additionally. Uh, and so in this recording, I, I'm only going to play the audio because the tech skills, I'm not, I don't do editing too tough on these joints. And again, this is a test run for the deep dives, the mixed, what's it? Mixed heritage, world history, deep dive. So the editing uh, proclivities at the moment are going to be very modest. So we're just getting audio right now. But there is a video to this and it is beneficial to see the video because all the sounds are coming either from the musical instruments or the musicians themselves. So there's no recordings, there's no digital overdubs or anything else like that. This is all like acoustic. Well, kind of, sort of, it's recorded. Uh, but it's re uh, recorded from acoustic. Uh, the sounds of the, of the sea, the birds, and all that. What up? Uh, so uh, two brethren on, on the Dizze, um One brethren on percussions, which includes uh, either looks like probably the xylophone as well as the drums. And then the other brethren, who is Malay, is also on percussions, which includes what some kinfolk might see or whatever as a, as a rain stick, but it's a different type of device, but then also uh, a, a some hand drums as well. Um, so anyways, those are the four brethren who are recording this music, and I'm just going to play it, let it speak for itself, um, and, and let, the, let the relationship share itself.
大家好，我是杰胜，我是维良，我是崇伟，我是 Fernandez。祝贺新加坡笛子学会成立二十周年。So that is the recording.、Uh, again, it's the、uh, Singapore Ditsu Society, Singapore.、Uh, they didn't give the credits、um, for the musicians,、uh, or maybe, maybe they do, and it's just in Chinese. And I yet to translate in an effective way. Oh, <laughs>、um, that's that's an accent that I don't practice that often. <laughs>、um, so, anyways,、uh, if you look up the、uh, Singapore Ditsu Society twentieth anniversary,、uh, you can find the recordings. God willing,、um, and、uh, this one again is the quartet of the Brethren and Ibi Da Ba Da. So、uh, again, that's the mashup. It's a mashup of.、Um, Of songs from my understanding, from what I observe,、uh, and one of those songs happened to be "Kong Mong Do." So when I heard that, again, I've been listening to this song for decades at this point, not knowing nobody else that knows it. And so when I'm looking at the, the, the society, just、uh, like listening to the、uh, recordings and 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 studying, I'm like, hold up, I know that song. What y'all doing that song? Uh, okay, it's not just me. There's a reason why Puto Mayo puts it on his album. So obviously it has some type of appeal. But anyway, so when we get that affirmation, like yo, that's just a small nugget. It's a small nugget, nugget.、Uh, but at the same time, yo. And anyway, so that's the joint.、Um, and again, particularly if you listen to the, to the end of it, you can see the instruments, like the, that sound, that waves on the ground, on the on the shore sound. Uh, the brethren actually has like a, it looks like a hand drum, but it,、uh, maybe like small pebbles or something like that, or or、um, something similar that he just、um, moves around to make it sound like the waves, and then the brethren do their own whistles to make it sound like birds,、uh, and that flourish that、uh, the brethren,、uh, if you look at it, he's wearing the the dark yellow joint,、uh, he does the flourish on the lower tone、uh, dita.、Um, To int to introduce the Kong Mandur、uh, part of the mashup or the medley, yo he does that note or the, he does that that flourish for a long time and yo playing a wind instrument it's not it's not the easiest of things because yo the breath you gotta work on that breath, <laughs> um so but I mean just in terms of breathing and 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 being able to an extended breath it's not just a matter of like I'm I'm accustomed to piano and drum, um so. Like to hold a note and play it for like twenty seconds nonstop. I'm sure there's techniques for for、uh, saxophonists and、uh, trumpet players, and additionally, to like get some air. I saw a brother playing like for a swan gave、uh, in Ibo land in Nigeria.、Uh, in, in a recording, he does this one note on the on, on the horn instrument, a traditional African horn instrument that sounds actually very much like a Chinese horn, distinctive sound,、uh, Chinese Indian.、Uh, but he holds it. For like thirty, sixty seconds, and he—it seems as though he—it's like a bag, bagpipe type of situation where he's able to like get some air in while the note is still going, and and、uh, the mechanics. Oh, it's wondrous! It's wondrous. So, but this brethren, from from my experience, playing these these like this, like it's just a matter of like practice and and being able to do breathing exercises to be able to do that flourish. And it's one thing, it's one thing to be able to breathe and keep that breath going along, but to keep it strong. To get that note, that sound, to be constant, and then continuing on into the next sequence, yo, impressive from a very, very novice、uh, practitioner. How many, how many times are going to do this? Anyway, all right.、Um, so that's part of it. Now, one thing about the drum also,、uh, it's interesting hearing, hearing again. I'm, I'm relearning the drum. It's been, it done been taken from my ancestors. That's no play and that's no joke. Cut and hands cut off, to this day. Don't things are done through different ways, but still, it hasn't been returned too tough to brethren on this continent. The drum I'm speaking of, I'll bring it out whilst I speak of it. I thought we were talking about Eurasian, and here's a djembe.、Uh, it's multiculturalism. Let's get a sound on this. Anyway, point here is this. Point here is this. When listening to the、um, the drum, even 
I study the drone uh, at this point considerably when I'm avail when I have availability. One thing we can recognize: people talk about it very easily. The drum is like one of the first instruments kin folk learn. Silence is 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 probably up there. Um, but drum is the heartbeat. We learned that before we were even born. We learned the drum. How about that? That's facts. Everybody, one way or another, to this day, and even where science is today. Um, so we learn about that, the heartbeat. Uh, and it brings us back to that experience. That's part of the power and the strength of the drum. Now, that being said, uh, obviously, there are all different types of ways, all different types of drums, and all different types of ways of playing the drum. Um, we talk about traditional drumming, again, from Africa, West Africa particularly, but also East Asia, India, native drumming in addition. What we observe and what I observe in my studies is that um, we can see animals. And, if, and, and the different stylings of drumming, like when, when we listen to this drumming here of the, uh, of the uh, Singaporean brethren uh, with the Ditsu Society, um, there's a very distinct uh, East Asian Chinese drum and they're two different two different sounds. One is like a, um, a horse, uh, like um, trotting or not trotting, trotting, like that. Uh, and then there's like the the, the further active um, uh, drumming. And this is this is uh, a lot a lot with a lot of Chinese uh, music. Uh, but that and that sounds like galloping horses. So we hear that now. We're listening to a number of African like that. There's a uh, brethren whose name is uh, Kanate, who's an African uh, drum master uh, I listen to. And this is where like it hits me a number of years ago when listening to him. Like he does, he does, he tells a story just of the drum, and that's part of African history. That's part of African culture. Um, so I mean, music is that all all around the world, but particularly the drum. Uh, stories just through the drumming and so this I, I could hear it so clearly this one time I was listening to the, the to this track it's a performance that the, the, the brethren does with other brethren on stage um, and I listened to it for years and years and just kind of okay I'll cultivate myself generally now he's coming from Senegal uh, the Wolof in addition so it's a different, somewhat different stylings from Twi, Ashanti, uh, Igbo, Yoruba um, and otherwise however like it's, it's there's still like learn lesson um, and so here I learn, I, I listen because of that, in particular for that. And then one occasion I'm listening to it, and all of a sudden like, I, could, I could just see it plain as day. It's like, I won't liken it to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like reading all of a sudden, but it was like that kind of like, yo, I've been listening to this the whole time, and all of a sudden it just hit me. When I heard that, that this, his, his playing, and it's just him playing it by himself. He's got a, he does a thing where he does it by himself, and then eventually there's accompaniment that comes in an orchestrated kind of way. But when he's doing it by himself, I could hear what he's playing now. This this might be subject to interpretation, or whatever else. But literally, I could see a goat, like a, a little a goat, learning to walk, prance around. And additionally, by the way, he was playing the drum. And at first, it was like a caf cacophony of hooves on the earth, just all around or whatever. But then eventually, there's like the clearness of just a young goat, as goats do, just jumping around or whatever, playing around. I could hear that through the drum rhythm that he was sharing. Um, and then when, when hearing that, he brings in other animals as well by the different rhythms that he plays on the drum. And when the other, everybody else joins in, again, I was just like, wow. Not a word was spoken. And I just got that whole thing just from that. And again, it's remembering because that's where we come from, Kinfolk of African ancestry. Um, and that's one of the things that was intentionally uh, punished uh, for having a literacy of, not even to this day. So uh, I, I thank the Most High uh, for, for hearing it, and again, encouraged uh, to learn and study further. So again, now that hearing that, I can hear the kinfolk when playing uh, from Africa, hearing the hooves uh, of what, what it's like, because I've, in in, I've been in the animal, in the nature reserves, where the animals run wild, where they run, not wild, free. Uh, and I, I remember like what it feels like to feel the hooves of zebra on the ground, on the dry ground in Botswana and Namibia. Am I pushing it that way? There's probably a reserve in Namibia. Um, it was dry season. So I remember like hearing the hooves. So those things that, that one hear, hears on National Geographic, maybe kind of, sort of, like I know what that feels like, lightweight. Um, and, and again, all thanks and praise the most high. And, I, and then when I, when I hear the drum, I'm like, yo, okay, I see. Um, now, when, and then when I hear that, and I hear like the the the, the, um, the drumming from India, that 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 distinct thing, I see the elephants. 
I just feel, I feel like that wet, warm, like hot air, uh, and the big ear elephants um, just coming in. Uh, and it's like, come on, y'all. Yeah? It's so obvious um, and so beautiful. Uh, and then again, uh, the, the trotting hooves uh, from the Chinese rhythms. Uh, and then the gap uh, from, 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 the, from, the, from the dry lands and, and grasslands and further of, of, of China. Um, so, um, and then it, it translates into the dance. Uh, like again, like watching Tibetan dances. Uh, with the with the flowing like like birds in the prairies uh, on in in, in, the Apple, in the Tibetan plateau, it's it's like so natural. And then like going back to native heritage, the two two step, uh, listening and watching Lumi, uh, giving the, the the calls from the rainforest of of the west coast of this continent, uh, and 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 the and the um, uh, the rain, the rain, the rain, uh, shared through the wardrobe. Um, and the trees. So, anyways, uh, music is is an awesome thing. It's a, it's a beautiful and, and profound way to connect. Um, and so, it has a literacy all of its own uh, that children probably have much further proclivity and influency within. Um, and we give all thanks and praise. We give all thanks and praise the Most High. So that's the joint for today. Um, and uh, we, we talked somewhat about Eurasians of Singapore, um, even talked somewhat favorably and positive and affirmationally about European Eur Eurasians of Singapore. Um, I'm trying to think of, of, of like anything like of, of like a, a cheery positive note. Um, it's a it's a it's a very interesting culture. Um, and this is going a little bit away from the the proper like group of Eurasian society of Singapore or Singaporean Eurasians, and just like what, listening to the Singaporean culture because there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of media uh, groups, a lot of media projects on YouTube uh, from Singaporean youth and hearing like the, what Singaporean youth are talking about. I, I listened to that for a number of years um, for a while. Uh, it's been a while since I, because I'm off the internet, t uh, generally speaking, um, so I don't watch things as much as I used to. But, um, but listening to the to the to kinfolk talk um, about Singaporean culture, uh, about what the youth think about and what the youth are doing, uh, the jokes, uh, the vulgarities, the redemptive um, empathy, and and further, uh, there there's one, one can call it very Western. Um, and and that there might be a bias in that respect in terms of what's being presented and, and then what's being shared, particularly all the way over here to the West. Um, but at the same time, this, things are getting beyond just a notion of being Western because um, things are becoming further just like internet culture um, and beyond a specific attributability or exclusive attributabil attributability. How about that? Say that five times fast, not too cough. Not too cough. Or tough. Attribuibil uh -huh. Attributability, 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 attributability. Maybe not fast enough, but it's done. To the world culture. Uh, and a world culture that's feeding itself from coast to coast, from continent to continent, hemisphere to hemisphere. Class to class, varna to varna, ethnicity to ethnicity, religion to religion. And otherwise, so, um, and th the reason why I say it is because many of the kinfolk uh, uh, are mixed, are Eurasian, and a lot of the topics that the kinfolk address uh, in involve specifically the mixed heritage experience. Whether the kinfolk who are mixed heritage featured in those uh, interviews and programs are part of the Eurasian society properly or or otherwise, I know less about. I I, I know less about the details about that. Uh, I do know that many of the kinfolk who are featured in that are actually also mixed Malay. Uh, and again, that, fa that factors into those um, um, distinctions. And again, the Eurasians of Singapore are not just a specific kind of, are, are not just a general mixed heritage. It's a, it's a specific, uh, unique uh, cultural and custom and rituals. Uh, it has certain um, linguistic uh, implications. 
Um, again, there's a, there's a strong Eurocentric kind of um, uh, Christian, particularly with Christmas, um, foundational kind of um, uh, presumption or, or, or like a commonality. Um, and and it's, it's, it's interesting pheno uh, phenomenon of how it, 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 that it's a distinct f uh, characteristic from the, the quote-unquote norm or the mainstream of Singaporean society, which is Chinese Han. Um, so it's distinct from that, um, but and, and perhaps because of that distinctiveness, it, it, it acts as an effective anchor for all the different types of Eurasian experiences uh, to kind of just like circle around that because it has a, its own formidability of, it, of its own and its own influence and geopolitical advantages. So all the different Eurasian groups kind of migrating in it like um, um, circum... circumambulating or whatever. I'm trying to think of the right word and get a little bit late now. We're only almost two hours into this joint. Um, but just um, moving around that kind of anchor uh, as a way of having some kind of like affirmational uh, identity that is or experience and heritage that is distinct from just the presumption of Han. Um, and even if kinfolk aren't necessarily the most active in terms of being a Christian practitioner or otherwise, culturally it's a, it's a way of having a, um, a tangible, uh, geopolitically advantageous identifying factor uh, that connects other Eurasians with each other, even if one is from Portugal and one is from uh, the Netherlands, one is from Britain, uh, there's still that kind of general kind of um, cosmopolitan kind of connector. Um, and there's in that, in that distinction from the mainstream, there's a further liberty of, of like being one's own self. And so there's a distinct history, there's distinct personages and, and legends within the Eurasian experience um, that, that factors into it as well. I mentioned the Jingli dance, uh, the line dance, and that, that becomes a, um, um, a, a cultural trait to share with the rest of Singapore of a distinct Eurasian experience uh, that people can learn. There's a video I've seen about a uh, sister in, in hijab um, sitting in the audience watching the Jingli and, 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 and uh, seeing people um, learn how to do that line dance. Now again, how, how where, where that levels in terms of haram and otherwise, that's going to differ on the imam we ask or otherwise. But anyways, the point is like it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a something that the mixed community, the mixed heritage community, the Eurasian community in Singapore brings to the table of Singaporean culture uh, that's distinct uh, and also advantageous uh, for the rest of Singapore to, be have, to have some literacy concerning. And again, there's institutional framework within the Eurasian society. Uh, there's the museum, and then the museum is a, a center of culture. It's, it's, it's an activity, a center of activity, gathering, and otherwise. So um, uh, there's a formidable um, staying power of the Eurasian community within Singapore. Um, and uh, with the, um, the diplomatic um, acculturations and, and navigations of convention, um, so I shared that entire joint without saying the name of any one particular specific Eurasian kinfolk. What? Uh, yes, not intentionally, but again, it's according to the knowledge that I have. Uh, what I can provide is that. Well, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it at that. So I tried to end up conclude on a very positive and, and high high spirited note but this intrinsic self deprecation every time I think I'm out it keeps coming back in so anyways that being said uh, we give thanks and praise the most high for the energy and the information and the inclination and the perspiration blessed love and peace the rest of our life